Hello and welcome back in Nature Going Smart. Today I would like to celebrate all women out there with this video. Thanks to the travels in different areas of the world and my own efforts in becoming a female scientist, I'm personally witnessing a world that is still heavily dominated by men culture. For example, it's not uncommon to participate at seminars and see most of the speakers being men or even most of those asking questions publicly at the end of the lectures. The writer and feminist Virginia Woolf, speaking to the girls at the two women's colleges at Cambridge University in 1928 and later written in the essay A Room of One's Own, states the importance for women of connecting with women culture and legacy. By doing so we grow a strong sense of belief towards many incredible things that we as women can do not only equally to men but actually in our own unique way. As an homage to this powerful concept I'd like to introduce you to women scientists whom despite adversities made it to express their full potential and inspire me to do the same. I encourage you to please add the names of your own heroines in the comment section below. They're probably going to be different names because we all come from different cultures, so please enjoy! Laura was born in Bologna, Italy in 1711. Her father was a lawyer of non-noble origins. Since she showed an intellectual interest early in her life, she was instructed in Latin, French, mathematics, philosophy, metaphysics, logic, and natural philosophy. Laura's intellectual abilities were soon known throughout the city of Bologna. Scholars visited the Passi home to meet the child who was wise beyond her years. At only 20 years old, she became a member of the Bologna Academy of Sciences and participated in a public debate on philosophy with five notable Bolognese scholars. This was noted by the Pope, whom sent an encouraging letter to the girl. Within a month from this triumph, the University of Bologna awarded her with an honorary doctorate. She was soon asked to undergo yet another public examination, which was again successful and granted her a teaching position at the university, the 25th chair of physics at the oldest university in Europe. Despite Laura's dedication to improving herself as a scientist, gossip relating to her status as a single female was seen as inhibiting her progress. She soon married a colleague at the University of Bologna and mothered eight children. She died at the peak of her career in her town of Bologna. Although several Italian universities had employed female faculty members dating back to the 13th century, none had yet taught physics. She was initially paid much less than her male colleagues, but Laura became the first woman to earn a professorship in science at any university in Europe. She worked extensively on the electrical machine and despite being controversial for her time, she helped spreading Newtonian mechanics throughout Europe. Ada was born in London in 1815 from the famous English poet Lord Byron, although she never got to meet him. Her mother, Lady Byron, had a mathematical training herself and insisted that Ada, too, studied mathematics, an unusual education for a woman. She dutifully posed her studies at 19 for marriage and motherhood, but resumed studying as soon as she could. In 1843, she published a translation of the analytical engine by an Italian engineer to which Ada added extensive notes of her own. The notes was the first published description of operation used for solving certain mathematical problems for which Ada is often referred to as the first programmer. She died only at 36 of uterine cancer. Ada was the first computer programmer. Her algorithm was designed to be carried out by a machine. From our modern perspective, it is evident that her mind was visionary. She speculated that the machine could manipulate symbols in accordance with rules and that number could represent entities other than quantity. This marks the transition from calculation to computation. Her mindset of poetical science led her to ask questions about the analytical engine and how individuals and society relate to technology as a collaborative tool. 
She's often referred to as the prophet of the computer age and I'm pretty sure she would be one of the most influential people on earth where she's still alive today. Sofia was born in 1850 in Moscow and was raised in a noble and educated Russian family. Although her keen interest in mathematics developed very early, she was forbid by her father to read or study the subject. At that time in Russia, women could not simply leave home to go to study at the university without the written permission of their father or their husband. Therefore, at age 18, she entered a nominal marriage which Throughout its 15 years caused Sofia a lot of problems, it was a source of intermittent sorrow and exasperation due to the frequent quarrels and misunderstanding with her husband. At 19 she travelled to Heidelberg in Germany but was forbidden to matriculate in the university and could only participate to lectures for three semesters despite her uncommon mathematical ability. At 21 she moved to Berlin but once again was denied access to the university due to her gender. Three years later, she presented three papers worthy of a doctorate at Göttingen University and was granted one in mathematics with maximum grades. Despite this, the best job she was offered was teaching arithmetic to elementary classes of schoolgirls. She committed to raising her daughter and continuing her studies in private. During this time, her husband committed suicide. In Stockholm, she carried out her most important research, taught courses on the latest topics in analysis, and became an editor in the new journal Acta Mathematica. She took part in the organization of international conferences, and in 1891, at the height of her mathematical powers and reputation, she died of influenza at only 41. In 1874, Sofia was the first woman ever, outside from Renaissance Italy, to obtain a PhD. In 1888, Sofia Kovalskaya won the Prix Bourdin from the French Académie Royale de Sciences for research that examined how Saturn's ring rotated, a theory which is still in use today. The following year, although the Tsarist government had repeatedly refused her a university position, she was elected to the Russian Academy of Sciences. She won a prize from the Swedish Academy of Sciences and was finally appointed to a chair at the university, becoming the first woman professor at the modern uni European University, as well as the first woman on the editorial staff of a mathematical journal. Maria was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1867. By the age of 10, she had lost already her sister and mother and got closer to her dad, who was a professor of mathematics and physics. Despite she graduated with the highest grades from her high school in Warsaw, she was unable to enroll in a regular institution of higher education because she was a woman. At that time, she battled with depression and moved to the countryside for a full year. Maria started to regain trust in the possibility to continue her career in science when her and her sister became involved with the Condestine Flying University, a Polish patriotic institution of higher learning that admitted women students. After that, the two sisters made an agreement that could allow both of them to continue their education. The first two years, Maria would stay in Poland, working as a governess and providing financial assistance to her sister, studying medicine in Paris, just in exchange of similar assistance two years later. After finishing her studies in Paris, Maria returned to Poland, hoping to work in her chosen field. But she was denied a place at Krakow University due to her gender. Maria returned to Paris by insistence of Pierre Curie, whom she soon married and with whom she researched radioactivity for long hours despite not having a dedicated laboratory. In July 1898, Curie and her husband published a joint paper announcing the existence of an element which they named polonium. In 1903, Maria was the first woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize. But don't forget, she wasn't just a Nobel Prize on physics, she was also a wife and a mother. In 1904, she was given birth to her second daughter and in 1906 she was already a widow to her beloved husband. But she did not give up. In less than a month from her beloved husband's death, she became the first woman professor at the University of Paris, taking a chair at the Department of Physics. In 1910, Curie succeeded in isolating radium. 
She also defined an international standard for radioactive emissions. Being a Polish woman in France, she was misrepresented in the tabloids as a foreign Jewish homewrecker. Soon after accepting her 1911 Nobel Prize, she was hospitalized with depression and a kidney ailment and returned to her laboratory after a break of about 14 months. She gave much of her Nobel Prize money to friends, family, students and research associates. During the First World War, she became the director of the Red Cross Radiology Service and set up France's first military radiology center. During post-war years, she toured the world giving public lectures and raising significant funds that granted her the possibility to establish her French institute as one of the leading radioactivity laboratories and founding another one in Varsovia. In 1934, she died from her long-term exposure to radiation. In 1995, she became the first woman to be entombed on her own merits in the Pantheon in Paris. Not only she was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, but actually was the first person to win or share two Nobel Prizes. Under her direction, the world's first studies into the treatment of neoplasms were conducted using radioactive isotopes. In an unusual decision, Curie intentionally refrained from patenting the radium isolation process so that the scientific community could do research unhindered. She founded the Curie Institutes in Paris and in Warsaw, which remain major centers of medical research today. During World War I, she developed mobile radiographic units to provide X-ray services to field hospitals, saving thousands of lives. People are currently developing Curie's radioactivity research into new form of alternative treatments and improved security systems. Rita was born in 1909 in Torino, Italy, by a Jewish family. Her father was an electrical engineer mathematician, her mother a painter. Despite her father's belief that women should not pursue careers, at 20 she realized that she could not possibly adjust to the duties of wife and mother as expected from her father and enrolled in the University of Turin to study medicine. After completing her graduation, she started working in a lab and enrolled in the three-year specialization in neurology and psychiatry. But her academic career was cut short by the fascist manifesto of race from 1938, which introduced laws barring Jews from professional careers. Rita decided to construct a laboratory in her own home and conducted research in secrecy. During the Nazi invasion in Italy, she lived underground with her family in Florence. From 1944, she was hired as a medical doctor and worked hours in a war refugee camp. When the war ended, she accepted a one-year residency at Washington University in St. Louis, but ended up staying more than three decades. In 1958, she became full professor, pioneering the studies on nerve growth factor and epidermal growth factor. In 1962, Rita established a research unit in Rome, dividing her time between this city and St. Louis. Levi Montalcini won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1986. The latter part of Rita's life consists of a long list of uh, scientific prizes and awards. In addition to continuing her research, she also was a FAO Goodwill Ambassador and since 2001 she was an Italian Senator for Life. Levi Montalcini died in Rome on the 30th December of 2012 at the age of 103. Even towards the end of her life, she continued conducting research every single day. Though the scientific community did not appreciate the importance of nerve growth factors at first, they came to realize that along with other growth factors that were discovered later, it offered possible treatments for conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, infertility and cancer. She helped establishing the Institute of Cell Biology in Rome, Italy, creating an education foundation of scientific training for women in 1992 and set up the European Brain Research Institute in 2002. Laura, Ada, Maria, Sofia and Rita weren't just incredible scientists. All of them were also artists and poets in their private life. Rita, for example, not only illustrated all of her papers herself, but even designed all of her clothing and jewelry. The intelligent union with their feminine, intuitive side helped them develop imaginative leaps. On top of that, they focused on creating a legacy and helping others to access scientific information. So many more women should be mentioned in this video. Rosalind Franklin, Dorothy Hodgkin, Rachel Carson, but I'd like to leave you with a quote of a computer programmer and neuroscientist, 
Alexandra Elbakian. Born in Kazakhstan at just 23, she created the revolutionary open access platform SciHub, which makes free and easy to read scientific literature. Just like these women, don't hold back your intellectual and creative potential. We all need your brilliant ideas. Nice to meet you. I come from China and my question is following. What do you think about the importance of women in future research? You know, if I understood your question, you have never to worry about this point because it may change one day from you. Now women can do what I could not do when I was a young woman like you are now. So you have not to worry, or women should not, as the future may be very different from what we suspect it will be. So it is not important to believe, it is important always to act in a very ethical way, very rigorous, how you will behave, how you will face difficulty, how you will enjoy good moment.